The German Empire often considered itself to be the first German nation-state, and its creation finally fulfilled the long-awaited dream of unification that had been in the heads of many for decades. But, of course, the empire was never an ethnically homogenous state. It had a very significant minority of Polish people in Posen, Upper Silesia and West Prussia. French was the dominant language in some parts of Alsace-Lorraine, and people living north of Flensburg usually spoke Danish. Today we're focusing on the history of the Danish minority in the German Empire, how it ended up in there, what their position was, and how it all eventually came to an end. Our story begins in 1848. At that point both the Duchy of Schleswig and the Duchy of Holstein were in a personal union with the Danish crown. While majorly German-speaking Holstein had been a part of the German Confederation, the much more culturally mixed Schleswig was solely under Danish rule. With the emergence of nationalistic feelings on both sides of the border, a dispute arose when the newly crowned Danish king, Frederick VII, announced a new national constitution, while also declaring that he would strive to firmly integrate both duchies into the kingdom. King Frederick found himself under a lot of pressure by Danish nationalists, which resulted in him formally annexing Schleswig on the 21st of March. The German population in the south reacted by proclaiming a provisional government in Kiel and pleading for access into the German Confederation. Now it was time for Prussia to react. In the in the name of the German Confederation, Prussian troops marched into Schleswig on the 23rd of April and quickly managed to push the Danes to Jutland. Due to international pressure from Russia and Britain, Prussia was forced to retreat and the London Protocol of 1852 guaranteed the Danish personal union over Schleswig and Holstein but barred the king from further integration of those territories. Fast forward 11 years to 1863 and King Frederick VII dies without a male heir, and so an argument arose in which it was discussed who would now rightfully rule over Schleswig and Holstein. A certain Prince Friedrich von Augustenburg claimed both thrones on the basis that his family had long-reaching entitlements to the duchies, reaching back centuries despite his father having explicitly renounced his claim in the London Protocol. After he had crowned himself in Elmshorn, many German nationalists demanded that Schleswig and Holstein would become a new German federal state, led by Friedrich von Augustenburg. The Danish nationalists and liberals were not happy about this and argued that Denmark should not so easily give up its claims on Schleswig. They began to organize huge demonstrations in front of Copenhagen's royal palace, to the point where the city's police chief began to worry about a complete collapse of law and order. So the king was under a lot of pressure, and as a result, he signed the November constitution which was supposed to integrate Schleswig much further into the Danish kingdom. The problem was that you now had three explicitly different stances against one another. First there were the Danes who insisted on the November constitution and on the further integration of the duchy. Then you had the German nationalists who supported Friedrich von Augustenburg's claim and were ready to support an armed intervention, and then there were also Prussia and Austria who insisted on the London Protocol. It was a conflict that could be resolved any other way, and Prussia under the leadership of Otto von Bismarck noticed that the time to expand its northern borders had arrived. In February of 1863, Prussian and Austrian troops crossed the River Eider and occupied much of Denmark in a relatively short period of time. In the Treaty of Vienna, Denmark had to give up both duchies. Holstein was administered by Austria, and Schleswig got under Prussian control. Of course, this was only a temporary solution, as Austria was not ready to just let Prussia annex these territories without any form of compensation. Bismarck realized that war became essentially inevitable, again, and saw this as an opportunity to finally kick Austria out of its influential position within Germany. After Prussia defeated Austria in 1866, the duchies were made into a German province, and five years later, they were ruled by the German emperor himself. Now if you too would like to hide your internet activities from the watchful eyes of Kaiser Wilhelm I, you might be interested in today's sponsor, Atlas VPN. Atlas offers you the best and most affordable VPN deal on the market for just $1.99 per month with a 30 day money back guarantee, if you use the link in the description. The app is extremely well designed and easy to use, and it allows you to connect to 45 different countries by pressing a single button. Marvellous. As soon as you've established a connection, you can keep your internet searches in private. With a single subscription, you can protect an unlimited amount of devices, be it computers, mobile phones, or Android TVs. I didn't even know those existed. On top of that, Atlas also has other neat features that block annoying ads, malicious links, and trackers, and they even notify you when someone is trying to steal your data. But there's more. If you like travelling, you could potentially save some money on sites like Booking.com or Kiwi.com, which determine your prices based on your current location. So this VPN essentially pays for itself. Atlas can also help you access content that isn't normally available in your country, be it on Netflix, Steam or YouTube. Once again, Atlas VPN is running a very tempting discount right now where you can get a 3 year subscription for just $1.99 per month and a 30 day money back guarantee. So click on the link in the description and grab yourself this sweet deal. Of course, the German-Danish border dispute was far from over. 
The Danish majority in northern Schleswig consisted of about 200,000 people. This number is a very rough estimate because the distinction between Danes and Germans was not always that easy to make. For example, Danish loyalists living in Flensburg usually spoke German at home and in public. There was also a big number of Danish speakers who considered themselves to be German, and there even was a small minority who identified themselves as neither, or simply called themselves Schleswigers. What makes this even more confusing is that the Danish-German language border wasn't clear at all, and in many villages and families it was very common to speak both languages. So, in the end, the only thing that mattered was how each individual chose to identify themselves. In general, the Danish attitude towards living in Germany changed rather drastically in the late 1870s. Before that, Article 5 of the Treaty of Prague in 1866 promised that the territories of northern Schleswig would be returned to Denmark if the local population explicitly wished so. The treaty also guaranteed that every person could claim Danish citizenship, which freed them from the compulsory military service in the Prussian army. Many of the more radical Danish nationalists weren't happy at all, and simply left the country. In total, about 60,000 people decided to start a new life in Denmark. This led to the Danish national movement losing a ton of momentum, as a big portion of its most avid supporters just left. This is reflected very clearly in voter participation. In the North German federal election of 1867, about two-thirds of the people in northern Schleswig walked to the voting booth. That number would decrease to less than 50% just two decades later. Then you also had the case of Flensburg, a city that saw rapid industrialization almost immediately after German unification. The rise of the number of workers migrating to the city exacerbated the social tensions and put the national differences in the background. For the workers in Flensburg, a life without misery and poverty was significantly more important than the national issue, and over the course of the following decades, the city became a stronghold for the Social Democrats. The previously very interesting combination of a pro-Danish but German-speaking city faded out more and more with each generation. Of course, there was resistance from the very beginning. Nikolai Eilmann, one of the members of parliament in the North German Reichstag, said the following in a speech in March of 1867. We Northern Schleswigers have given enough evidence of our Danish nationality in recent years. A clear proof of this lies in the elections to this Reichstag. I have recently had the opportunity to say that they have shown that half of Schleswig is Danish. The people of Northern Schleswig have always been loyal to Denmark and the Danish government. We therefore believe that we are entitled, by virtue of our nationality, to be separated from Germany and united with Denmark, as the peace of Prague holds out to us. This hope we cannot and will not give up. And, contrary to the Polish minority, the Danes had a sovereign mother country behind them, who the German government wanted to have at least somewhat cordial relations with, so there's that at least. In the first few years under German leadership, not much was done to weaken the Danish national movement. The language at schools remained, at least in first and second form, Danish, as Bismarck considered the threat posed by Danish nationalists to not be that great to the state's overall stability. Still, however, repressive measures were taken against critical Danish journalists and pro-Danish organisations. In 1878, Germany and Austria agreed to nullify Article 5, thus completely destroying all hopes of Denmark receiving their territory back in the foreseeable future. Although Otto von Bismarck did indeed seriously consider ceding Schleswig-Holstein after the Franco-German War of 1871, the matter became more and more unrealistic as he didn't want Germany to appear weak on the world stage. It was only in the late 1870s that Germany introduced their first Germanization policies to slowly assimilate the minority population. It was ordered that German become the sole language used in administration, and that about half of the classes in schools had to be taken in German. Ten years later, all classes had to be held in German, except for religion. Like many other oppressed minorities in other countries, the Danes found out that the best way to defend yourself is by organising. In 1888, the journalist Hans Peter Hensen founded the Velje Verening for Nordslesvig and soon became the leading voice for the Danish minority. Many other organisations were founded dedicated to lectures, organised singing, coffee time and sports. They were often supported by artisans and farmers from the countryside and they often considered themselves to be the exact opposite of the German officials and the educated elite. In 1892, Hensen ensured the creation of the Sönerjusk Skolleverening, which hired teachers tasked with supporting parents with teaching Danish to their children, as Danish private schools had been completely banned. Newspapers such as the Flensborovis and the Heimdale became some of the most important voices advocating for the Danish cause. 
Henson's strategy consisted of slowly but surely working towards an improvement of the situation by winning over those Schleswigers who had, up until this point, been mostly indifferent, and by negotiating with Prussian politicians with the idea of rejoining Denmark always sitting at the back of his head. His ideas were opposed especially by an editor called Jens Jesen. He argued that the Danish minority should actively protest against German rule and insist on their right for a referendum like Article 5 promised. And he also drew his future border a lot further south than hence never did. So, as you can see, the Danish national movement was in no way united, especially not during the early 1890s, where Bismarck's successor, von Caprivi, followed a much more lenient policy. But after von Caprivi got ousted in 1894, harassment against the Danes resumed and increased more and more. When the votes for the Danish party during the Reichstag election of 1898 went up drastically, Kaiser Wilhelm II demanded that peace and quiet should finally be brought to Schleswig. And so a certain Matthias von Köller was assigned as governor of Schleswig-Holstein, and let's just say he really wanted to bring peace with whatever means possible. Under his rule, about 1,000 Danish citizens were expelled from Germany. For instance, the Landtag of Sonderburg attempted to pressure parents to take their children off Danish schools under the threat that if they didn't, all Danish citizens from their respective villages would be sent away. Some Danish organisations were banned and pro-Danish voices were suppressed. Von Köller also attempted to buy Danish property and reassign it to German citizens, simply to what was being done in Posen at the same time. But, of course, none of these measures had the desired effect. Instead, the Danish population felt much more mobilised and united after von Köller finally left in 1901, especially after it received outspoken support from the Scandinavian countries. So, ironically, had Prussia not introduced these repressive measures and had it not begun its Germanization policies, the Danish population would probably, over the course of time, have assimilated into German society, but Alas, the German Empire was an absolute expert at angering national minorities. As Germany saw itself in a diplomatically isolated position in 1907, many militant nationalists demanded that repressive measures against possibly treacherous national minorities should resume, and so in 1908 the use of non-German languages was forbidden in public events, in areas where German was spoken by more than 60% of the population. In the years leading up to the First World War, the tensions between German and Danish-speaking Schleswigers intensified strongly as both sides organised themselves in nationalist organisations. When the war broke out in 1914, pro-Danish soldiers were sent to the front lines against their will, and many responded by quickly deserting to Denmark. After the war had finally come to an end in 1918, the Treaty of Versailles clearly demanded that referendums should be held in two different zones, in which the local population could freely decide which country they would rather belong to. The line between those two referendums was drawn north of Flensburg and south of Tönnern. There was a difference in that the northern zone voted en bloc in its entirety, while in the southern zone each village voted for itself. The actual border was finally redrawn in February of 1920, and it would remain definite to this very day. As of today, about 50,000 Danes still live within the Federal Republic of Germany, under much better conditions, of course, as agreed upon in the bonn copenhagen declarations of 1955. They are regarded as a protected minority, and have their own schools, their own libraries, their own churches, and even their very own representative in the Bundestag. Similar rights have, of course, also been granted to the German minority living in Denmark. Alrighty then, Dankeschön for sticking around until the end. I have to especially thank a cup of tea, James and Felix, for their support on Ko-Fi, which I am really really grateful for. Have a fantastic day and see you next time.